Truck it, it's time. It's time for your nooner with Dooner. Happy Good Friday, everybody, or Passover, or Easter, or just good weekend if you're non denominational. By the way, for those of you who've been asking where I got this uh, lovely Hawaiian shirt here with my, my cat on it, this custom jersey, you want this, you want this drip that I'm putting out there? Go on Etsy and just search like customized pet Hawaiian shirt. They're like, I don't know, 33 bucks, but people think you're rich. I shared this online and someone was like, they got to raise interest rates to 10%. Look, man, I didn't pay much for this shirt. It's 30 bucks. But you know what? It feels really nice. It's like super soft, nice and like linen-y. Not sure what it's made out of or where it's made. Anyways, today on the show, we got a lot coming in. Uh, What are we going to do? Let's see. We got super trucker Justin Martin. He's going to talk about the trucking market downturn turning one. He'll share his driver's perspective on all that. Uh, We'll talk about should you get a company tattoo? And what's Freight's least favorite Easter candy? SD's forwarding worldwide. They acquired Legacy Logistics and are intent on offering best-in-class trade show and exhibit services. We get deep on uh, how trade show logistics works and why this is good synergy between SD's and Legacy. George Mason University's Brent score up. He offers an academic breakdown on the latest in unmanned delivery. Plus, he used to be a wrestler. I wonder if he's ever seen Vision Quest. Universal Logistics Services, Carlos Barjana, takes us south of the border to talk about freight coming in and out of Mexico to the USA, plus the importance of setting your brakes. We got to rate the strap work, why trains keep hitting trucks, Super Mario Brothers movie review, and much more. Let's tip the band, and we'll get on into it. Your customers and investors want to know that your company is serious about sustainability. Show them the depth of your commitment when you rely on AIT Worldwide Logistics for your freight forwarding needs. From Scope 3 carbon footprint reporting to calculating emissions at the transaction level, partnering with AIT sends a clear message to stakeholders. You mean business when it comes to sustainability. Learn more at AIT.com. Check them out after the show. Right now, let's bring up Super Trucker Justin Martin. How you doing, man? Doing good. Love the hat. Love the hat. Did you have to uh, arm wrestle a pirate to get that one? I didn't. You know, I had to go to a, uh, like, a go- I hate golf. I'm not a golf fan. Like, oh. people are afraid. Of, Come watch the Masters. I'm not no yuppie. I'm not watching. No, the only golf I play is mini golf, Justin. But last mm-hmm. year, um, USA, what was it? USA Truck. They wanted, uh, what's, we had to go down to, like, their golf event. That's but that right. was more so I, I could, that. like, hang out in the sun, right, and ride a golf cart. <laughs> That's me. Yeah, get some vitamin D. Yeah, I don't. I like to stay indoors. I like to go see movies. Like, for example, yesterday, I took my boys. Mm-hmm. They're on spring break, so after work, I took them over to the Super Mario Brothers movie. Ended up having to go earlier than I intended because Kamala Harris landed over here in Chattanooga, and it, like, stopped traffic everywhere. So we yeah. actually had tickets to a different theater. Um, but my, like, GPS said 45 minutes to get home, and we were close to, like, the AMC oh. 18. So I'm like, forget it. We'll just go to this one. We'll grab some tickets to the IMAX. It was beautiful, but look at this. Look at these critics, man. They know absolutely nothing. 54%. And this is some of the garbage. This is some of the garbage these people were paid, these professionals said. They said uh, Super Mario Bros. is not intended to work in the same way as conventional films do. It's not cinematic enjoyment. It's about experiencing a brand. Um, this person says, this isn't a movie. It's a checklist of fan expectations. And Matt Rodriguez says, this film is plastered with references, Easter eggs, and just about anything you could imagine from the game. And he's got the splatter mark. That's a negative? Justin, mm. this is Super Mario Brothers. It's for kids. It's it's literally a kids movie. Also, do they not remember the 1993 one that came out? Like that oh compared God. to that movie, like anything is better than that. It did everything it needed to do. And it's not like they, they left some like deep plot or some deep lore out of the Super Mario <laughs> Brothers games where like the plot line is your princess in another castle. They had to develop something off this premise. I think they did a good job. Now, if you're not a Super Mario Brothers fan, like, yeah, you probably will not get much out of it. Don't yeah. go see a Super Mario Brothers movie. You know what you're getting when you go when you go watch a movie like that. You taking the boy there yet, or is he too young? He's too young. Not not even just too young. Just he doesn't have the attention span. We're lucky if we can get through like a ten minute episode of uh, Spider Man and Friends on Disney Plus. Like he he just like he'll he'll lock on for about five minutes and then he's just you know bounce off the couch. So he, yeah, he would never sit for ninety minutes in a movie. You got to play him some like old Rasta Man um, reruns or Rasta Mouse. I mean, it's good stuff. <laughs> Rasta Mouse. Yeah, we try. 
Anyway, so like that that's the good. Go see Super Mario Brothers this weekend. Take your kids, have a good time. But now we got to get into some bad because you might not even be able to afford yeah. a ticket if you're a truck driver right now. Look at this rate right here. Like, like we'll just kick it off with this one. Show this rate. It's, it's $1,553. Pick up in Madison, Wisconsin. It's going to Laredo, Texas. Uh, it's 1,412 miles. So do the math there. That's like, what, barely over a dollar a mile to move this freight, yeah. Justin? Yeah, and it's not even like an LTL load. It's 44,000 pounds, so it's going to be taking up the entire trailer. Um, a lot of guys are speculating this this might be like a Mexican carrier taking it back over across the border. Um, so maybe they can afford that. But yeah, U.S. guys here, that anyone taking that, they're going to be hurting. Why do you take a loss on a load? Is it all just equipment positioning? Equipment positioning or to try, if, if you know that you're in a dead spot, you know, you're trying, you're trying to get somewhere where the market's a little hotter. Um, trying to get to Laredo, Texas, like on the weekends. If you're not picking up by Friday, you're going to be sitting there till Monday at least. So I don't, I don't know what day this guy was picking up or dropping off, but I'm, I'm hoping if it was like a, a U.S. carrier, he got there by Thursday and get something Friday and keep moving. Yeah, well, some of you, some of you naysayers, even though we've been in a downturn for a year, there's been all those naysayers on on LinkedIn with their uh, their big mouths, and their orange shirts, thinking they're experts. But take a look at this one. <laughs> Today is the worst I've seen it on the spot market with the live DAT load board. You should watch loads get crossed off as they were posted. There was no time to run credit checks on unfamiliar brokers. Brokers like TQL had busy signals seconds after posting. Almost all loads had posted rates. Some would cross off their garbage rate and lower them almost immediately. It was as if they were saying, Saying, I'll keep lowering the rate till my phone stops ringing. This is a 150 mile radius of Philly yesterday, and today it's like this all over. I'm hoping this is just because nobody is buying stuff going into Easter, but honestly, I got a call at 10 30 last night, and it got covered by a desperate truck for next to nothing. By the time I returned the call seven minutes later, most of these guys are hauling out of New Jersey for less than a dollar, um, for a dollar 30 a mile, it looks like. Should be a lot of belly up trucks in the next four weeks. Stunning. Yeah, no, we're we're seeing this right now with a lot of the owner operators. You know, when Freightways released their um, polling data, it, a third of them that replied said that they would leave trucking altogether. You know, if the market didn't improve, and you know that that it's sad to say, but that's kind of what needs to happen right now. There's too much capacity of carriers right now, and you know the the, the whole meme of say no to cheap freight is just gone. Like nobody says it anywhere. Everybody's taking what they can get. Well, the new meme is don't say no to contract freight. Take a look at the take a look at the OTRI here, the outbound tender reject index. It's the lowest it's yeah. ever been since we've tracked it. It's 2.98%. How does that correlate to that spot market post that we saw? It means that none of that contracted freight is getting rejected because the spot market sucks so bad. So everyone's taking the freight that they have under contract. It's not going to the spot market, which means there's a lot less competition for loads within the spot market. There's nothing there to bring it up. There's just all these spot market guys that don't have the relationships yeah. that have to fight over this crap that they're finding on the boards. And it's getting really, really bad, Justin. Yeah, and it, it shows no signs of approving. You know, as we're seeing, there's more and more trucks coming out to the market every day uh, until that flight lines or even comes down. You know, it's, it's simple supply and demand. Bill Packets, he says, last three weeks, rates have lagged um, down, lagged down yet again. Shippers trying to rapidly rebid to lock these rates in. Could get interesting mm -hmm. if there is any pressure starting in May. All these contract rates are based on rock bottom and cannot hold with any pressure on capacity. Let's talk about capacity. Show this next image here, and this will give you a good idea of why this issue is happening. Because freight isn't yep. just a correlation of, vo of volume. It's a correlation of volume and capacity, right? How these two things play together. So we have these low Volumes. We also have the total count of tractor fleets for authorized hire escalating, just going up. In fact, Justin, the jobs report just came out. I know some people are hoping, and no one wants anyone to get fired, but people are hoping participants would wash out so this line would start going downwards. But jobs are up 5,200 in trucking. Yeah, yeah. It, we see that a lot. Anytime the market um, or the economy feels like it's going to be like headed towards a recession, everybody floods into trucking because it was always like, you know, it's one of those kind of jobs where everybody knows there's high turnover. So there's always going to be somebody hiring. And that's what we're seeing right now. Why are they still go away? Why is that going up? I don't know. <laughs> go and everybody, away. Everybody wants, everybody wants to be their own boss. Yeah, I, I totally get it. I, I don't begrudge anyone that wants to get in the industry, but they have to understand that when you have that many people coming in all at once, that's going to bring prices down. So why do people not want to reject these rates? Because this is what the national price is for the spot rate index. Look at Freightwaves National Truckload Index seven-day average. Show this chart up here. It's down to two dollars and twenty-nine cents, and that includes fuel, Justin. Yeah. And this is the average. No, was... Like the average means, and an average people uh, that means that 
People are paying higher and people are paying lower. A lot of people yeah. are reporting lower. We're seeing those $1.30 out of New Jersey rates. We're seeing all the people we talk to online and all the phone reporting. They're like, hey, this average is 2.29, but that's not even what I'm seeing. It's worse. Yeah. No, if it's the average, what we're seeing now is half the people are paying even less than half. Um, no, I, I, I would love to pick the brain of some of these guys that are taking these loads. Are, is it just a matter of them trying to get home? Uh, is it just desperation or is it literally the best deal that they can get? And here's another thing, like so much that fueled this freight flow that had that chart up so high that caused this big come down was imports, was freight coming to the United mm -hmm. States, was retail yeah. sellers bringing things in. So I have even worse news for you. Those of you who have freight into L.A. Long Beach, you already know this. If you called them last night, no ship, no gate, no rail. In fact, Hector, he got mm -hmm. this note. My buddy Hector it says, please note all L.A. LB terminals are closed, second shift due to labor action. If you were inbound to the port with a container, please drop it at L8 Port Yard. Hasn't been open for two days. Low volumes, not enough workers. Where's the freight going to come from, Justin? I don't know. You know hope maybe after Easter, um, people start wanting uh, those air fryers again. <laughs> I really don't know. And, and anyone that's like in the market right now and they're picking on just one thing, you know, if they're blaming only one thing, they're really missing out on the bigger picture. There are so many factors at play right now that, is, that are pushing uh, the rates of everything down. It's not good. It's not good. Now, you've been a driver, yeah. and you have the driver's side view. You've seen a lot of stupid things on the road. But have you ever seen Jeff Hardy driving around in his Honda Civic? Roll this tape. Off to his ladder <laughs> match here. Has no strap work to put on the roof and just decides to go what? Horizontal? At least he's like in the middle, you know, he, he kind of has some awareness of like just how wide he is, but zero consideration for other people on the road. What is the worst thing you've seen when you're driving about a non-professional idiot going down the road? Lots of mattresses. People put mattresses on the roof and they think like two or three bungee cords is going to hold it. It's not. As soon as that wind picks it up, it's gone. Well, yeah, I mean, you saw the cover yeah. on this one. That'll be a rate to strap work later, but there's two guys <laughs> holding a giant box on their roof, just holding on to, like, the plastic straps that, like, just keep the box itself together. Yeah, yeah. People, people don't understand, like, once you're, once you're up to, like, highway speeds, that wind is no joke. Have you had a close call like this before? Take a look at this trucker. He's going down the road here. Everything looks clear. He must be in – this video is either flipped or he's in Europe, though, because he's on the left. I think it's Australia. It's overseas. Yeah, left hand, left side driving. Yeah, Look at that guy. Man, he barely missed him. Yeah, I've had um, – I was in Colorado once uh, just outside Denver, and I actually had somebody coming coming at me uh, down I-70 going the wrong way. I mean, it was like one of those, like, you, you blink and you miss it. And it took me, like, a good 10 seconds to really process what had just happened. And I was like, oh, my God, somebody was going the wrong way down the highway fast, too. It wasn't just some drunk driver that was lost because they're usually pretty slow. You know, this, this guy was, like, coming straight at me and then swerved right at the last second. <sighs> Oh, well, glad you're okay. Glad, glad you're here with us. We might, have to reset the, we might have to reset the clock on your life. We have to reset the clock on these trains hitting trucks. People have seen that. I mean, this, is, this, this happens all the time, but, like, it's been more magnified because of what happened over in Ohio. So people are sharing these videos yeah. all the time. They tend to go more viral. But trucks and trains, they are not good friends. They are good enemies. Take a look mm -hmm. at this video right here. And tell me why this keeps happening, Justin. Why are trucks not clearing tracks? Well, we're seeing with a lot of these, they're all low boy trailers, so they're getting hung up on the tracks. And usually uh, intersections like that have signs posted everywhere saying, you know, trucks don't come this way or low boy trailers don't, go, don't come this way. You can raise the deck on the trailer a little bit to get over tracks like that. But, you know, if there was a mechanical failure or, um, you know, the, the hump is too high for them to get over, they're, they're going to get stuck. And that's, that's what we're seeing here. A lot of it's just failure to plan. You know, you, you got a trip plan. You got to know where your um, intersections are going to be and where not to be. Yeah, I have Operation Lifesaver coming on here in a couple of weeks. They will give you an overview yeah. on, on the blue sign to look for, the number to call, and how to run away from your truck if you actually do get stuck, and how those things happen, and what to look out for, especially if you're a driving rookie or even a veteran. And sometimes old guys are running mm -hmm. out of these trucks too, Justin. It's not just like yeah. some greenhorn. Yeah, it only takes once. You know, you, you, you could be running for 20 plus years, and if you just forget to, you know, check one box, you know, that, that's what that's what all it takes. That was in uh that happened in Southern so South Carolina too. That was on Monday. Yeah, Norfolk Southern. Trip. Yeah, I asked, my, I asked my parents. They said it was seventy miles from their house. Huh. Now, Justin, what carriers have you driven for before? Oh, uh, Schneider, Green Valley Transportation, United States Postal Service, uh, uh, Bean Brothers Transportation, 
Let's see some other ones. Pat Salmon companies. I, I have probably like 11 carriers total under my belt. So you must have like sleeve tattoos, right? Uh, of these. No, no sleeves. Look- <laughs> no did, well, what about this guy? Take a look at this right here. This guy li- loves his trucking company so much that he put a giant Prime <laughs> Ink tattoo on his forehead. Now, we're in an industry with about 100% turnover for drivers. That means that in a year, most drivers will not stay within their company. They're going to jump somewhere else. So is it a good idea to get a company tattoo? Maybe not that one that big, especially if you're going to be jumping from one carrier to another. You know, put, have, a, have like a, you know, the Henry Rollins style where it's like you know, a bunch of badges down your arm. You know, do it, do it that way. Like one gigantic one, it's just like, okay, now you're, now you're stuck with it. Yeah, a little too excessive. Yeah. If you were yeah. to get a logo, though, like at what, what is your favorite trucking company logo? Oh, geez, that's a good one. Um, well, at least for the ones that I drove, um, probably, probably USPS because, you know, it's, it's pretty iconic. You know, the nice yeah. eagle. I mean, FedEx to me is just like perfection in oh, simplicity with the just arrow. the arrow that the EX forms. Yep. Like, I don't know if it's the coolest tattoo. Like FedEx, you kind of seem like a, I don't know. That's not like a bad Gotta make sure it's pointing forward. Yeah, you make sure it's pointing forward. Well, hey, uh, you know, it's almost Easter, right? So we had to pull the, uh, we had to pull the freight industry and find out what the worst Easter candy is on the market. Here's a little, uh, to, to set this up for you though. I don't know why this data is like from 2015 in this candy store article. That's almost a decade ago, Justin, but it says, here's the difference in sales between stuff. It says Halloween is 2.63 billion for candy, but Easter is also 2.63. I would not have guessed that Easter candy and Halloween candy had the same sales, would you? No, because with Halloween, you're, you're buying not just for your kids, but like everyone else's kids. Right? And with Easter, you're only buying for your kids. Yeah, well, maybe, maybe there's a lot more Easter egg hunts going on that we know that we don't know about. Well, here's some facts. It says among those who celebrate Easter, 87% plan on buying Easter candy. For those who don't celebrate, 33% still plan on getting at least some jelly beans, right? People will spend about 21 bucks on average. And if you've been to the grocery store, that's believable. Like even stupid things like jelly yeah. beans, like $7.99 or $9.99 for a bag. Just like, wasn't this like $3.99 just a couple years ago? When I worked retail, I would I noticed a trend that like a lot of parents were kind of treating Easter as like Christmas 2.0. Instead of getting kids like a big extravagant Easter basket, they would just get them like, you know, a video game. For yeah. Easter. Yeah, I do still like a Lego set or something. Not me. I mean, the yeah. Easter Bunny does that in case, you know, the kids are listening. <laughs> They're still pretty young. Um, total Easter spending $18 billion in 2019. So still pretty beefy. Um, hasn't really helped uh, up those spot rates, but they're going to sell 90 million <laughs> chocolate Easter bunnies. 87% of parents will prepare an Easter basket for their kids, and 81% of them will steal some kid some candy from their kids' baskets. Do you charge your kids like a dad tax? I, I do on all sour candy. Yeah, anything he brings home from daycare, we, we totally swipe it. Here's the top 10 worst from candy store. They had jelly, like generic jelly beans, like the bro- like throw that up. The Brock's ones, you know, like throw that. Yeah, here we go. I like, uh, I like those. There's nothing wrong with those. Okay, I mean, I like jelly beans. I just don't like the generic ones. Like, give me some jelly mm. bellies, but throw away, like, the butter popcorn. Those are terrible. Here's one. Oh, Number yeah, nine, yeah. Cheetos Cinnamon Puffs. I feel like the word Cheetos should never be contained within an Easter basket. Well, that's how you know how old this list is, because half of these candies probably aren't even made anymore. Well, what about this chocolate cross? It even has, like, giant nails in it. If you take a <laughs> close-up on this thing, it has, like, it has, if these were, like, to scale, like, Jesus would have had, like, 12-foot nails put in his arms. Yeah, they're not nine inch nails. They're like thirty inch nails. Sour Patch White Chocolate Bunny. Does th- that Ugh, what? No. Is the chocolate is the chocolate uh, sour? That's that's what I don't understand. That seems disgusting. <laughs> when we polled people, I put up Peeps Black Jelly Beans and Cadbury Eggs. Pulled the freight industry, and it was a close call. Black Jelly Beans, those generic mm. black jelly beans, forty seven point four percent. Only ten point five percent hate Cadbury Eggs as much as I do, and forty two point one percent are not Team Peeps. Team Peeps is like. It's like when they were trying to put Roman Reigns over as a face in the WWE and trying to force it down your throat. I feel like every year they're like, peeps, they're over, they're big, and nobody likes them. Like, why are they here? Yeah, no, I, I am a Cadbury egg respecter. I, I love them. I put them in the freezer. That way I can have them throughout the year. Um, trying to eat them when they're, when they're like room temperature is annoying because they, they melt and they're gooey and stuff. But yeah, if you put one in the freezer, they're nice. Well, Jeff Wenzel says, I remember putting all the peeps in the microwave to see what would happen. Casey Lord says, you forgot the worst ever, the hollow 12-inch chocolate bunny. Just pure disappointment when you bite into that thing and it's air. No, you know, who wants a solid chocolate, you know, foot tall bunny? 
I bet Tesla semis are like just running out of batteries and getting towed all the time trying to pull those things. <laughs> Monique Crapper, she says peeps. They don't even deserve to be labeled candy. Van Guzman says, what the F is a Cheeto cinnamon puff? I'm, I'm with her on this one. Those words just don't go in a basket. Carrie Danucci, another peeps hater. William Hogg says, if it's not a Reese's egg, it's trash. He's right. Reese's eggs have the best ratio of chocolate to peanut butter. Everybody knows that. Mm -hmm. It's just a fact fact Justin. yeah no I, I like how they also rebrand them from eggs to pumpkins uh depending on the season yeah well what is in your opinion what's the worst of all oh uh me and my wife agree that the the whoppers are like the oh. worst kind of candy those little like oh, yeah, malta chocolate covered balls yeah, yeah nobody who who likes those they're terrible they're terrible i mean my pick is uh is cadbury eggs though nothing nothing worse than just oh. that that fluid that goes in your mouth it, it just gonna be the heebie-jeebies buddy put them in the freezer they're good yeah well, hey, guess what? We don't, we don't, don't put anything in the freezer because June 21st and 22nd, 2023 in Cleveland, Ohio, we are coming back at you with an in-person event. It's a blueprint for the future. Justin, show this graphic to everybody. Are you ready to rock Cleveland with freight waves? In June 2023, freight will overtake the Huntington Convention Center of Cleveland for the second annual Future of Supply Chain. The greatest minds in the transportation, logistics, and supply chain industry will share insights, predict future trends, and showcase emerging technology the freight waves way with engaging discussions rapid fire demos interactive sponsor kiosks and more june us join us june us join us june 21st and 22nd 2023 at the huntington convention center in cleveland ohio to learn firsthand how companies are digitally transforming the the management of their supply chains explore the latest technology newest applications and of course Get to meet us, all your favorite uh, Freight Waves TV hosts and all of the different guests. There's going to be over 1,500 attendees, everyone from shippers, brokers, VC finance, media people, carriers, 3PLs, tech software, and other. Get on down to Cleveland and network. What are you most excited about coming up in Cleveland before I let you go, Justin? Well, the, so my first one that I went to in Rogers, Arkansas was a blast. It's so fun to see... You know, people at companies I would never, as a driver, that I would never get a chance to talk to. Um, I had lunch with one sales guy who said he he crushed more sales uh, in like the one day than he had in like the last two years. Uh, it was also the first Freightways event that went off uh, post COVID. Um, so as we saw with Matt's, everyone's like really excited to get back into live events. So if you've if you've missed out on live events since COVID, don't miss out on this one. It's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be great. We have former NFL player Desmond Clark speaking. We got Coke. We got Shopify, L'Oreal, Black Rifle Coffee. All of uh, all these amazing speakers. And J.B. Hunt is going to be throwing a party at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. So it'll be a blast. Justin, hey, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thanks for having me. Take care. Happy Easter. Take it easy, my man. All right. Meanwhile. What's going on here? Now, I've heard conflicting reports on this particular one. Some people say this is pirates trying to board that container ship right there. But some other people have told me that those are military people trying to board the container ship. What do you guys think? Do I have any maritime experts in the audience? Now I'm, uh, I'm confused. I know they have those big water. If those are really pirates, they have those big water cannons that they can like, like shoot down on you or maybe drop an anvil. I don't know. Anyways, or some sort of aerial drone. Maybe you could take him out. I'll speak to an expert now. It's Brent Scorp. He's a senior research fellow at Ricotta Center at George Mason University. He's done a lot there in telecommunications, aviation, wireless, technology, and he's also a former wrestler. I understand he spent a little time on the mat. I did too, Brent. You ever see the movie Vision Quest? Yeah, years ago. Years yeah. ago. Yeah, it's, uh, I, I, need, I need to watch it again. It's, uh, it's a great film. Shoot was great in that. He was the bad guy, right? Matthew. Mo it was so weird seeing Matthew Modine in Stranger Things like as an, as an old guy because I know him from Vision Quest. Yeah, and if I recall, I mean, the wrestler, he knew his stuff. I mean, you've probably seen these wrestling movies where they get actors who... You're yeah, clearly models who have never like touched a map before, but uh, yeah, Vision Quest it was uh, it was legit. So what kind of uh, what kind of maneuvers do you do now as a research fellow? I've heard the term a million times, but from the horse's mouth, what does like a research fellow actually do? The way I put it to people, I'm I'm much like a professor who doesn't teach classes, uh, which okay. I, I think a lot of professors would prefer. So I I, uh, I I read in my areas of scholarship, which for me are um, Emerging technology, transportation, drones, autonomous vehicles, and and produce um, op eds and reports and white papers for the general public, but also lawmakers and regulators. 
Now, we've covered drones a lot of times on here, and regulation always comes up, and the tech comes up, and the transportation side comes up. What are you finding out in your research about drones and how they can factor into transportation? What kind of impact they're going to make? I, I think it's a very promising sector. It's the reason I spend most of my research uh, on, on this area in the past few years. Yeah, I'm here right outside Washington, D.C., looking out the window in Metro D.C., one of the largest metro areas in, in the United States, and in, in the low-altitude airspace, it is completely unused. I mean, it's just totally unused. So we have this vast resource, public resource, that, that's almost completely unused. And, and today we have the technology of drones, automation, batteries, um, computation networks to, to finally use it for, for small, uh, small aircraft, small and large aircraft. And so I, I think there's tremendous promise, but, um, but uh, yeah, it's an open question of when and uh, regulations will allow this in the United States in, in, in a way that affects uh, the, the average person and brings commercial benefits to the average person. What's good and exciting in drones right now in 2023? What kind of developments are we seeing and what kind of proliferation are we seeing? It seems like every week I see at least some press release about a new retailer, somebody adding drone delivery to their service offerings. Yeah, I used years ago, I used to keep track of all the pilot programs out there. I mean, it just became so immense. I mean, I can't keep track anymore. As you said, it seems a company is announcing something new all the time. Um, so there's probably hundreds of pilot projects in the United States. You know, often a drone company is working with a local jurisdiction or a county. Uh, they're getting FAA waivers to to fly, uh, you know, above uh, neighborhoods. Um, but at the end of the day, I mean, despite years of doing this, these are still pilot programs. Um, they're not commercial. They're not commercial programs. You know, Walmart announced a few months ago um, a few dozen stores. They're going to start testing. Uh, drone drone pilot, uh, drone deliveries to to households, but even there, um, I, I saw a news story about how this operates. You have to have one of the operator drone operators drive, and you got you got to stay less than a mile from the store. The, the, one of the drone operators has to drive to the house where delivery is going to take place, and another drone operator is at the store flying the drone. I mean, this is it's not a commercial service, and, and they're doing this all by the way for four dollar delivery fee. Yeah. I mean, this is not a commercial service. So, um, yeah, until, I mean, the, the big problem is under current regulation, essentially you cannot, you cannot fly multiple drones, um, at the same time. And despite companies have the ability to fly dozens of drones with a single monitor, um, but that's just not permitted. And until we get there, it, it's not going to be a, a commercial or widespread service. Wow. So, like, what is the regulatory pushback? And it, it, it almost sounds like you're not that optimistic. I mean, there's a lot of challenges. I mean, it depends how you, how you look at it. We The U.S. has a very safe aviation system, but it, it's centered around, you know, large commercial airlines. Um, and so, frankly, drones are, are somewhat of an afterthought. And, 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 you know, and there's, you know, some justification for that. Um Commercial airlines are a huge commercial sector. They're moving hundreds of millions of people every year. And, and you know, this new technology, the small uh, uh, sector is, if, if anything, a nuisance to federal aviation officials. Um, yeah, I think largely seen as a nuisance. I mean, there, there's a lot, of, a lot of things to be sorted out. Um, and, and so that's why I see my job is, is showing, uh, you know, I, I, believe, I believe this will be a transformative technology. Um, uh, in time, but it, it will take time to get there. And, and it's, we've, we've got to get past the step of it being treated as a nuisance. Um, and, uh, and I think there are ways to, to do that, but it's going to take, uh, some pretty large, uh, changes in thinking about aviation in the United States. Yeah. You know, like overseas, you hear about like medical deployments and stuff like that being put to remote regions. And that sounds like a really good use case. But in the United States, what is the best use case right now? Is it is it cities? Is it suburbs? Is it rural areas? I mean, I'd imagine you'd want density when doing this this type of delivery, but maybe it helps out with distance too. I think, um, yeah, I mean, last mile delivery to households, I, I think there might be a market there. I, I think that'll take a while. I mean, particularly, I mean, neighborhoods are very protective of noise and and other things, so I think that will take take a while. I see um, uh, large cargo drones, you know, basically small airplanes, um, 
but without a pilot, I, I think that is, is a promising sector. Um, uh, uh, it's it's uh, doing high value uh, cargo um, medicine, but but also other types of logistics. Yeah, I think cargo drones because you know r- removing a pilot from say a commercial airline, uh, you know, seven forty seven carrying hundreds of passengers, that doesn't affect the the operating costs of that airline all that much. Removing a pilot from a small plane, um, or you know, uh, or you know, a cargo plane, uh, small cargo plane, that that does have a, a huge effect on, on the on the profitability of, of that operation. So I think I think cargo drones have, have uh, uh, will be one of the first sectors where, where you see commercial deployments. No, I have a I have a question for you. And it's kind of a personal one. You were you were on FCC's broadband deployment advisory committee, and I'm curious, why does 5G suck so bad so often? For for me, like there's so many times I'm like this is so this is like worse than 3G. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah I won't I won't belabor it. There, there there could be a lot of reasons. I one one is um, the types of spectrum 5G providers often use is 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 the type of spectrum that doesn't penetrate buildings well. So that that's probably a, a big part of it. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Well, if people want to read some of the research you've done on on unmanned uh, delivery and drones, where would I send them to? So uh, my, my Twitter feed is, is very active. You can follow my, my handle, B Scorup, uh, on Twitter, and, and then Mercatus.org. Uh, if, if, if you just search my name, you'll find uh, a lot of my longer form reports and, and writings. What's the coolest thing about uh, attending Mercatus, by the way? Coolest thing? I, I mean, it, you know, I, I have a lot of freedom to pick my research projects. And, yeah. and yeah, as, you, as you indicated, um, you know, my areas of, of research include autonomous vehicles and, and drones. Um, and it's, it's, a, it, it's fascinating and it's fun to dream about what the future can look like and, uh, and help, help shape what that future looks like. Who's automated out first, truckers or brokers? Oh, geez. Um, yeah, I mean, my, yeah, I'm not an expert in trucking, but I've heard, I mean, long haul trucking, that, that's a very difficult job. I mean, there, there's, uh, you know, often a shortage. Um, and so it, it seems like there might be a commercial appetite, frankly, to, to automate long haul trucking. Um, and, and, you know, the, you know, it sounds like kind of short haul trucking, there, there's more interest and, and obviously it's nice to be home at night. So I think long, long haul trucking. All right. I disagree. I say the brokers. I say the brokers. I okay. think that chat GPT is going to eat them alive. No, I don't want to scare all you guys. But I do think it's going to automate a lot and maybe cut into some jobs. But you know what? It might also enhance things. All right, before I let you go, what is your least favorite Easter candy I'm pulling the world? Yeah, I might. I might. Yeah, I heard the end of your last segment. The black jelly beans are, are, are yeah. awful. Um, yeah. It's hard to reconcile, yeah. especially if they end up in a handful with the other. And it's like, why? Why did you do this? Yeah, right, right to the trash. Yeah. Well, hey, I appreciate it. Have a, have a great holiday weekend um, and, and take care. Thanks for sharing some of this. And uh, don't be a stranger. We'll have you back to maybe talk autonomous vehicles next time. Great. Thanks for having me. Take care. All right. Did you know that AIT Worldwide Logistics plans to reach net zero emissions by 2035? That's five years before the date targeted by the Climate Pledge and 15 years in advance of the Paris Agreement's goals. But that's just one part of their overall commitment to corporate social responsibility. Whether it's protecting the planet, nurturing the communities where we live and work, or ensuring high-quality business continuity, AIT is taking action today to deliver a better tomorrow. Learn more at AITWorldwide.com. But right now, people, it's time to rate some strap work. Let's take a look. Gentlemen on the cover here. Tom Messinger says, something tells me you could have moved the passenger seat all the way to the front, folded it forward, and fit that box in the back seat. But yeah, well, where do you put the passengers holding it on the other side? He'd have to ride in the trunk. Brandon Pass says, how is he steering the wheel? Yeah, I don't know. Do you think that's one long arm, Brandon, or do you think that's a team job? I, I think there might be two guys in that vehicle. Jim Water says, I love how people think that holding the load makes any difference at all. If it's going, it's going. Chris Mayberry, no license plate strap work level equals gone in 60 seconds. Hey, good point. Stolen vehicle, maybe. Jake Noble says, whole different aspect to lending a helping hand. I see the Texas sign on the trunk. How is he able to steer and hold his beer with just that one hand? <laughs> and uh, Indy Trucker says, the detachable kid origin story. For you, uh, for you, uh, the boys fans out there. And Joseph Delucy from uh, Target, he says, I look forward to you putting together a best of straps at the end of 2023. Good boy, Joey. I got to, uh, I got to get a spreadsheet open to start 
doing these. There's been so many. I've had more than I uh, anticipated. But now let's talk a little acquisition, right? Let's talk to some people who are winning. It's Lance Harcrow, COO at Estes Forwarding Worldwide, and Ernie Magalotti's SVP trade show at Estes Forwarding Worldwide. Gentlemen, thanks so much for coming on the show today. Good morning. Thank you. Good afternoon, actually. Now, you guys aren't in the same room. What for? So, Ernie, what part of the world are you coming in from? Uh, Reading, Pennsylvania. Oh, and Lance, where are you at? I'm in Richmond, Virginia. Interesting. All right. All right. Tell me a little bit about what went down here. I was reading the press release and it says Estes acquires legacy logistics. And now you're going to be this huge player in the trade show space. How did it all go down? Well, uh, EFW was fortunate enough to uh, hook up with uh, Ernie and Legacy. Ernie's built such an, uh, an amazing organization there that's focused into the complexities of the trade show logistics space. Uh, you know, it was certainly a space that we had a, a huge interest in. And, uh, you know, the organizations culturally meshed uh, tremendously. And uh, so we were able to uh, work a deal with Ernie and and they're now part of the EFW family and we, we couldn't be happier. Well, Ernie, that must've all sound good to you. Why was Legacy interested in joining forces with EFW and Lance over here? Well, you know, at first, um, you know, I had Legacy for 22 years and uh, in this space, you know, specializing in trade show and event logistics. And, you know, I really wasn't looking to sell, but, you know, coming out of the pandemic, you know, the trade show world shut down and you know, there was not a lot of activity in our industry. And, uh, man, when things came back, the industry really ramped up. I mean, there was a lot of conversation that, you know, virtual trade shows would take over. But I think a lot of companies out there were very eager to get back to, you know, face-to-face -face marketing. And, you know, coming out of the pandemic and, and uh, building our team back, because I had lost some, some people in our organization, unfortunately, probably the hardest day of my life to lay some people off. But coming back, the trade show world came back fast and furious. 2022 was a great year. But, you know, we, we, I felt like we were capped out. You know, we, we, we just approached about 18 million. Um, the, the environment was target rich. A lot of customers, I think, during the pandemic were reevaluating their logistics and who they were using. And, uh, you know, we got a lot of opportunities in 2022. And again, I needed resources. Um, we needed more capacity. Um, we needed to upgrade our technology. And, you know, I started looking and, you know, EFW is a fantastic company. They got an excellent reputation in the marketplace. Um, you know, those guys reached out to me. And the more we talked, again, like Lance just mentioned, their culture is very strong. I'm a culture-driven guy. I mean, people drive our organization, and these guys feel the same way. They got a great executive team, great people. So I'm excited to be a part of it. And I really think we're going to make some, make some headway in this industry. Yeah, Ernie, I've been uh, with Freight Waves through the pandemic, and we put on live events here. And in 2020 and 2021, when COVID came roaring back, it ruined two years. Basically, it was it was such it was such a tough time. And it's so great to see this rebound. Our events are back up. Uh, myself, everyone else is getting out to events. You see the pictures all over LinkedIn, and it's great to see. But Lance, for you guys at EFW, what does this allow you to do now? How does this help your customers? Well, the expansion of, of that service vertical for us, you know, we had dabbled in, you know, kind of the trade show space for a number of years. We really never developed uh, the expertise and, and resources to attack all the different verticals within the trade show space. Uh, you know, this acquisition really allows us to do that, blend the resources of uh, the enterprise that we have here together with uh, Ernie and, and his team's subject matter expertise, uh, we really feel like we can build something that is going to disrupt the industry and provide services to our customers uh, that that have a blend and uh, the ability to overcome all the complexities that they deal with in that trade show space. I mean, at the end of the day, we look at every one of those trade show exhibits as perishable. And companies invest tremendous amounts of money in their marketing budgets uh, to attend these shows and, you know, making sure that their exhibits get there on time and, and safe is uh, imperative, but also being able to provide some additional services around that trade show space uh, that, that this acquisition and, and uh, expansion uh, is allowing us to do is is really, really uh, something special for us to uh, hit the market with. 
Ernie, Lance said something really interesting there. And it's like trade shows are almost like concert freight, right? You have an event, you have a location, and you have a very specific time and window that freight needs to be there. What is unique about serving the trade show space? Well, I mean, again, failure is not an option. I mean, yeah. that's that's unique in and of itself. I mean, you know, it's cliche to say that, but like Lance said, you know, Lance and, and his team's always said this, you know, every shipment has a story. But, you know, you look at companies, we have medical device companies. They spend years in research and development coming out with a new product, and they decide they're going to go to the American Heart Association show. I mean, if that product doesn't get there, that investment, not only the money they spent in research development, is all at risk. And um, so that's what makes it unique. I mean, you, you, it's precision delivery. And, and again, failure is not an option. No, no. And I think we've all been at trade shows where somebody has something not show up and everyone runs around with their hair on a fire. It can ruin your entire team's time there. And it can waste, like you mentioned, that big marketing budget. So with all that in mind, you have this combined force. You got this, you, you guys merge together. So in terms of the future moving forward, what is this going to mean for EFW and moving into vertical vertical marketing spaces? Well, we, we see nothing but expansion here uh, with, with this vertical. I think uh, being able to blend the assets and, and uh, resources of Estes Express with EFW and, and uh, the, in this trade show space allows us really to attack all the verticals within that market. So you have the exhibitor uh, vertical, uh, where you have an individual customer that has a, an exhibit booth and they're attending a show. You have the um, exhibit houses, uh, and, and that's a space that Ernie was very well established in and being able to cater to those exhibit houses and, and service them in a, in a very good, uh, you know, strong way. And, and now we're looking at the decorators, the decorators that are hosting the shows, that are responsible for the event side and being able to really provide uh, services to them that are more than just a show carrier, right? We uh, can blend the assets uh, with the forwarding expertise uh, and overcome the complexities that, that uh, you know, those, those um, decorators uh, experience today. So I'm, I'm very excited about that. We are looking at the international market as well as the domestic market. Uh, and we certainly have the breadth of resources to, uh, again, I think, make a difference in the industry and, and really make an impact uh, to our customers and the portfolio of services that we can provide. Very cool. Ernie, now you got me curious. So let's say I am the event planner for my logistics company. How soon in advance before an event should I contact a team like 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 you guys already e w e f w well the sooner the better right you know planning but it's amazing in our industry you know people sign up for a show a year in advance yeah and you know they got a lot of different d decisions to make you know who's coming to the event what do they want the booth to look like what products are going to de um, demo um, people traveling the president of companies and the last thing they think about is logistics so you know what we've done over the years is, and what's driven our success is we, we have a proactive approach. If you're an event planner, you know, we know you're going to, you know, World of Concrete show. We know you're going to, you know, National Truck Show. But we take a proactive approach. Our client services team will reach out to you and say, hey, you know, you're, you're going to this show and here's some dates and deadlines that you need to consider. And then we'll start trying to push the planning process. Say we'd like to pick up, you know, on this date, depending on the size of the booth. Um, if it's a truckload, obviously, we can do it in a shorter transit time based on the mileage. But we try to take a real proactive approach to the event planner to help them because, again, they don't think about logistics until the end. You yeah. know, there's so many other variables that they got to consider. I know. And, you know, we're in freight, so we should know better. We got to know better about, about these things. But let's say let's say there's some people, you know, they got some events. They want to learn more information. Where do I send them to? Well, you want to send them to EFWnow.com. I mean, we're just rebuilding out our page for the trade show at um, industry, but go to EFWnow.com and then you can select trade shows. And guys, I have a, I'm polling the freight industry. We'll start with Ernie. What is your least favorite Easter candy? Black jelly beans. I was listening to your broadcast earlier, the gentleman <laughs> owner. I, I do not like them. That's my least favorite. Black jelly beans are getting dogpiled. How about you, Lance? <laughs> Listen, from 
from my obvious girth, I eat a lot of candy, right? But the marshmallow peeps are the worst. I, I can't do the marshmallow peeps. <laughs> I gotta agree. Hey, you guys have an amazing holiday weekend. It was awesome talking to you. Congratulations on the merger. And uh, thanks for helping getting people to the shows on time, happy and without their hair on fire. Yeah, awesome. Thanks, thanks for the time. Take you. care. Take care, guys. All right, we got another guy here in the bullpen. It is my buddy who gave me. Oh, man, I just took out Tupac. Sorry, Tupac. Who gave me this battle bell right here? It is uh, Carlos, Director of Business Development Account Manager over at Universal Logistics Services. And uh, you just got back from Mexico, man. You got like that uh, I've been out in the sunshine vibe. That's right. I got a little bit of uh, my natural color back when I went home. Yeah. How was it? How was the trip? What was, what was the purpose of going down to Mexico? It was great, man. Uh, we, we went to visit a few customers down there in the Bajio area, which is the center of the country. And uh, man, it was fantastic. I, uh, it, th that whole area has exploded. Uh, the industry, the automotive industry is mainly booming down there. And uh, you have Honda down there, you have Mazda, you have uh, Mercedes, you have Toyota. So, I mean, it's huge, man. It's awesome. No, everyone always asks, like, is, is Mexico safe? Is it is it safe to do business there? Is it safe to go there? What was your impression being there in 2023? And I know, like, yeah. Mexico's big. It's not it's like some parts might not be good. Some parts might be bad. But, like, where you were. Exactly. No, no, no. I feel like extremely safe, to be honest. Uh, you know, I, it was obviously, like you, like, you know, there are areas that, that you shouldn't go to, you shouldn't venture out to. But as far as like doing business in Mexico, it's very safe. It, it was a great environment. I was ex I was very impressed with the growth uh, that the country has experienced, and and I think you know it's in the best interest to make it safe for uh, for investors. I would think so. I mean, uh, Mexico and you know uh, Central South, like Colombia, they're doing amazing work over in, in Colombia too, trying to trying to. Stand right. that up and, and get people to come back into the fold over there and convince them like this. It's not it's not an episode of Narcos. You can go in and manufacture well. And I understand it. So if you look at the freight here in, domestically in the United States, it's awful. It is not good right now. It's terrible. Rejections right. are 2.98%. Volumes are in the toilet. But how about in Mexico? What, how is cross-border freight doing? So it's actually experiencing a boom, man. Uh, different factors are, are, are driving it. Obviously, the whole Chinese-American tension is, is contributing to it. Uh, because now, you know, suppliers and, and manufacturers are looking into Mexico uh, to, to save uh, the costs. And they have a very, very great, greatly qualified workforce. Uh, obviously, you can you can find cheap labor, cheaper labor uh, down in Mexico. So booming. Uh, I know for a fact the automotive industry is, is growing a ton. And we'll talk about, you know, Tesla, for example. But um, like vehicles, uh like the, the sales of vehicles, it went up to 100 and almost 120,000 for March, uh, which is the first time they've been at pre-pandemic levels, uh, and uh, you know it's, they're they're beating that. So I think 2019 they were at 103,000 vehicles sold in Mexico, 100 and almost 20,000 uh, this past March, which is extremely good news, and that helps our economy because here in the U.S., because obviously a lot of the a lot of the suppliers are in the U.S. still, so. I know for Universal, we're moving a lot of those parts down to down to Mexico for the final assembly. Well, how so? You mentioned Tesla. How is that Tesla effect impacting that? I've already seen them have like a huge. Like speaking of Austin, for example, Tesla moved over to Austin, and now you're seeing a ton of other vehicle companies and tech companies move over there because you start creating an ecosystem. How is that working out in Mexico? It's amazing. It's so the same thing. So uh, Tesla is going for their fifth plant now in Mexico, right? They have uh, Shanghai, they have uh, obviously the U.S. and Berlin. And uh, now with Nuevo Leon, Monterrey, it's going to be huge. Uh, I think they're expecting to create about 6,000 jobs, just Tesla alone, down there. So that's going to be, I mean, it, the whole area is going to boom. I know a lot of the suppliers are already working in Mexico, but even more are going to come uh, to, to the country. And uh, not only Tesla now, but the Chinese market, uh, the EV market, is looking into obviously growing. I know BYD uh, has made a pledge to um, they have a beta market in mexico to sell 5,000 electric vehicles uh this this year alone so they have told us that or you know that, that they've told the mexican uh, uh country that they will be bringing a plant uh, byd to compete against tesla essentially interesting are, so are we you know there's been so much talk about decoupling from china and nearshoring is that really happening or is just china just investing in mexico now i mean i think i think that's just it, 
it's it's unavoidable, right? At this point, yeah, it, it's such a global economy, right? And uh, it, yeah, it, essentially, China is investing in Mexico as well. So it, Mexico will become the battleground of these two giant forces, and Mexico will end up benefiting from it. Well, that's a little close to home. So, you know, if you're in the United States, you should be investing pretty heavily down there, too. Um, you're really thinking yes. of this decoupling. I mean, there, there's a, there's almost a territory war. And we've seen what China can do in places. We can see with some of the loans they put out, some of the adverse conditions. They can take control of areas very, very quickly. And, and they are. And, and not only Mexico, but Central America, South America. I mean, you've seen it in Africa. So it, it, it is an, in, it's an intense war happening. And, and uh, you know, we're seeing it unfold. But, but like I said, a lot of these countries will benefit from it. And... Uh, Hopefully the U.S. will uh, will will take the lead and, and and invest even more. Interesting. So what is that? Is automotive the the number one import export going across the border right now, or, or what do you what what are you seeing in your volumes? It, it's it's actually yeah it's it's one of the highest. Uh, I, I don't know if it's the highest. I, I'll I'll be lying to tell you if if they are, but it's but it, it's a huge chunk of the market share. Uh, and uh, and yeah, I mean. There's a lot of manufacturing, as I told you, uh, not, not only American uh, brands, but also German brands down there. Uh, and like I said, Chinese uh, at this point. Interesting. Now, if I am thinking about having freight there or I have freight there creating a, a cross-border network, what do I have to look out for right now? Yeah, obviously, it's, it comes it comes to trust, right? Uh, whether you're in the U.S. or Mexico, it's all about trust. It's about relationships. Um like that, one of the reasons I went down there is, is to make sure those relationships are still in place and, and you're you're finding the right people. At the end of the day, just like in, in the U.S., you can you can get caught in the double brokerage scheme and stuff like that. you got to find the right partners and diversify your partners. One partner won't do in Mexico. So you got to have multiple partners and make sure you're, you're, you're getting to know the culture, getting to know how they do business down there, uh, you know, break bread, so to speak, with them. And, uh, and, and that's the key. Definitely diversify. Definitely make sure you're talking to them uh, one on one and uh, and, you know, keep 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 in touch with them, just like you will do here in the U.S. What about theft? I've, I've heard some theft statistics. Is, is that concerning? That is definitely concerning. Yeah, no, it's uh, and, and that's part of the, the culture uh, part of Mexico that, uh, you know, you know, me being Mexican, it's a it's a it's a tough it's a tough subject. You know, the, the, yeah. the, the safety, the theft, um, you got to have you got to have precaution. You know, there, there, there are certain corridors that are safer than others in Mexico. So you try to strategize your routing around those and, and make sure that you are, you know, staying within the boundaries of what what's considered safe so to speak very interesting now before i let you go like i said i'm polling the freight world carlos what is your least favorite easter candy man uh so i'm not going to discriminate i will i will haul any freight <laughs> I will, <laughs> sure. I'll, I'll, I'll do full, full truck loads of all of them uh but man the uh the candy corn i'm just gonna do that man i can who gives out Halloween, candy corn on easter, easter. I can, uh, yeah, I, I saw that you posted that. I was like, man, I, I can't do it, man. I, yeah, I want, that's not I'll even good at free. Halloween. Exactly, exactly. I, I'm there with you, man. I, I can't do it. So It's just infiltrating everyone. Carlos, people need some help with the cross-border. Where do I send them to? Uh, ULSVnow.com or our LinkedIn page, universallogisticsservices.com. Uh, hit us up and, and we'll be happy to help. Well, happy Easter, brother. Have a great holiday weekend. Hey, Take you. care. Happy Easter. I love the bell, man. Still looking great. You too. Oh, yeah, a little. There you go. Ha Happy Easter! There <laughs> Take we care. go. Take Hope care. To see you in Orlando. Are you going to be there? What's in Orlando? TIA? Are you going to be there at TIA? No, the next thing I'll be at is Cleveland, man. <laughs> Cleveland. Future supply well, chain. We'll All we'll right, take it easy, brother. Take, take care. Brother. care. Be good. Have a good weekend. All right, everybody, it's Friday. So what is it? Good news, bad news. Bad news and good news. All right, good news. You found a great place to pull over. Bad news, you forgot to set the brakes. Should have some volume on this. Maybe not. Okay, so what you guys are seeing here is uh, a gentleman here, his, his brakes are not on, the truck is rolling backwards. He is trying to hold on for dear life, and he just falls right out of the truck. Fortunately, it seems to have rolled... Rolls down the sideway. I wish the audio was there because the audio was great. It was like, how much you pay for this driver, Mr. Jones? But I guess we don't have it. Let's move on to something else then. Let's go over to, do we have audio on this one? Karma? Ready? Yeah. So we get a guy here with a hammer smashing these, these uh, cement pourers. They're in their cement pouring semi here. Off my lawn. 
and he's really mad that they're out working in front of his house, so they're smashing his lights with a hammer. And the driver and the worker are letting him, because they got him on film. He's not satisfied yet, though. He's already taken out two lights. He just keeps moving around the truck. He's not, like, bashing it that hard. He's kind of doing what the doctor does to your kneecap with the hammer. And the construction workers, they're not doing anything. They don't care at all. But here is where the FAFO happens. Makes his way over to the cement. He thinks he's going to destroy the cement that they just poured down by putting his dirty footprints all over it. But here's the problem, buddy. Cement dries pretty quick. As he learns, as he tries to exit this predicament that he is trying to get out of. Will they pull him out? Nope, he fell right into this cement. All right, now let's, let's not end on a moron. Let's, let, let's end on some awesome driving here. Let the drivers cook. Look at this guy. Look at this guy go. Right here, half skull scenery says so something like th something like that. I wouldn't mind driving a truck. I don't know, guys. I would have a lot of anxiety trying to maneuver that through the streets. Uncle Joe says that is a nice perimeter float, though. And Gerard said that is so easy. I've done it many times in my dreams. Hey, great looking stuff, everybody. Thank you for joining us on What the Truck. Today, we are a show that's on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. Look up What the Truck wherever you get your podcasts. You want to watch my ugly face, you can up on YouTube or download the Freightwave TV app. We're on social media, on TikTok, on the Twitter, on the Facebook at FW What the Truck. Or find me, Percy, on there for uh, my S post at Timothy Dooner. That is D-O-O-N-E-R. Have a great Easter Passover weekend. Take care and don't be a stranger.